Welcome back. Our second major conversation for today is uh, going to be, of course, uh, moving to the story of Itunu Babalola, a really sad story that we shared yesterday morning um, on The Breakfast. Um, we're speaking this morning with David Hundain, who, of course, uh, has been, you know, on the forefront of uh, uh, this case and, um, you know, done all he possibly could, I believe, uh, to bring her back home. Uh, good morning, David. Thanks for joining us. Good morning. Thanks for having me. All right. Uh, in the interest of time, we're going to go straight to, um, you know, just a brief, you know, um, um, summary of what the case is about and your challenge with the Nigerian response. All right. So um, essentially back in March, when I first broke the story, um, it's a new Babalala, it's a new Olajima Babalala, had been in a, a prison cell in Bwandoku, in Northeast Anagri Coast since 2019. Uh, basically for a crime that she did not commit. Uh, um, she went to the police in Cote d'Ivoire to report, to, to report a, a burglary of her apartment and she ended up getting set up for a, an offense that was completely plucked out of the air, picked out of the sky, uh, human trafficking. Uh, the reason this was done, uh, usually when the Ivorian police want to set up a foreigner for the crime, so as to extort money from them, they, they tend to favor the crime of human trafficking because uh, under Ivorian law, the, the bar for evidence is very low and the, uh, the statutory, uh, the, the, the mandatory minimum sentence, I believe, is 10 years at least. So she was convicted on the sole testimony of an eight-year-old child that she had never met before. Testimony which was contradictory in several places. But all the, the confessional statement she was forced to sign was written in French. The court proceedings were, were carried out in French. The public defender lawyer assigned to her was French speaking. Sentences were delivered in French. Everything was done in French. And she was not a French speaker. She, she was born and raised in Ibadan. She only moved to Ivory Coast in search of so called Muna Pastor. So she ended up in prison for 20 years. After two suicide attempts, um, she had 10 years knocked off the sentence. So she was supposed to be there for 10 years. In March, she, she was able to reach out to me through an intermediary. And the story came to my attention and I put it out there. So as far back as March, March 15, I believe it was, um, there have been responses from different um, organizations within the Nigerian government. So the Nigerian Diaspora Commission, specifically NIFCOM, and its uh, its chair, Abigail Dabiri, had both responded on social media at the time, stating that um, they are organizing a fact-finding mission to go to Bonduku to confirm that all, all the details on this case were true, which they actually did. And they went there and they confirmed these things and they put out a statement saying so, that they have confirmed that this girl is innocent, that the supposed offense that she was convicted for was completely nonsensical and absurd, and that they were going to do everything they could to get her out of prison and bring her back home. So that was in March. April, May, June, July, August, September, October, and now we're in November. That's eight months. And they did absolutely nothing. So on Sunday, basically, um, I think it was around 2 p.m. Nigerian time on Sunday, when uh, someone contacted me on Facebook, a complete stranger, to tell me that, uh, to ask me, are you the journalist that wrote the story of Becky Paul, which was the alias that she was known as in, in Cote d'Ivoire? I say, yes, I'm the one. Is that a problem? He says, yes, um, she's, she's unconscious, basically. She's been transferred to the hospital in, in Abidjan, and the hospital authorities are looking for her parents' contact details because it's looking as if she's not going to make it. Um, so, in, and, and then the person sent me pictures and videos of her condition. She was in a catatonic state. She was completely unresponsive. It looked really bad. So I put out a final, like, Hail Mary, Hit and Hope on social media to try and embarrass Nigerian Embassy in Cote d'Ivoire and the um, and NIDCOM and Abigail Dabri into taking some sort of action. Like for eight months, you've been putting out statements to the public saying that you're doing this, you're doing that, you've done absolutely nothing. She has still been in the same cell all this while. Nothing has changed. So now she's about to die. So can you please finally do something? Um, and then I myself was running around trying to make some private arrangements, trying to organize a fundraiser. Like, yeah, trying to, uh, to figure out how to, how to get money across to her. It's actually very complicated to transfer to us region, which is you know surprising. So in the midst of all of that, then a friend who was right there with her in the hospital room 
then sent me a voice note crying and said, it's okay, we can, we can stop making us effort now. She just died. So, um, yeah, that was, that was how the entire story ended. She died, basically. She was left to her own devices. After all the statements that were made public by public servants and by Nigerian government institutions, not, I mean, they did absolutely nothing. And she died, and that was the end of that. And then after she died, and then um, I put the story out there again that, yes, yeah, she's dead, finally. You know, I hope all of you are happy now. Then uh, it became an issue of, uh, it became a competition for who can cover their own backside. So, you know, uh, Nikon then the very next day, within 12 hours, put out the press release, uh, basically saying it, it's not our fault. Then um, I began to a series of, of TV appearances, also saying the same thing, it's not my fault. Then Nigerian Embassy yesterday also released a press release, saying the preparation of the same thing, it's not our fault. So it's nobody's fault. You know? It's probably even Itunu's fault. Yeah, that's the only person at fault. The Nigerian government isn't to blame. It's nobody's fault. Nobody was, was responsible for anything. It was nobody's job to get her out. It's just if you're Nigerian, you're on your own. Abika Rowe says that um, the commission got to find out about five months ago, and then they also involved um, that the Nigerian government got involved, got a lawyer. Uh, to appeal the case and they had started, you know, the process of appealing before they got the sad news that uh, Itunu is actually dead. Uh, you said that um, the Nigerian government didn't do anything. So I'm not sure um, what Abike Dadbury's um, mathematical ability is especially, uh, but if she says she, she only became aware five months ago, well, I'm looking at a tweet from her dated March 15, 2021. As far as I understand, from March to November is eight months. So she has been away for at least eight months. So I'm sure why she came and did it to tell that kind of lie. It's so easy to verify it. It's right there on, 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 on her Twitter handle. Anyone can go there and verify this for themselves. And during these eight months, all she and Bitcoin have been doing is coming out and putting out statements from time to time. Oh, they're hiring a lawyer. They're doing this, they're doing that. Meanwhile, in their communication with the family, what they kept on saying was, there's no money. There's no money. We're trying to hire a lawyer, but there's no money. And essentially trying to get the family, very, very, like this poor, struggling family, trying to get them to somehow come up with one million naira, or was it two million naira, to, to pay for a lawyer. Where were they going to get that kind of money from? So I'm not sure what she means when she says that they, 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 did, they did not do anything. And I'm not, I'm not going to have it, because this lady has died finally. So I think now that all the, the outcome that everybody was hoping for hasn't happened and the worst outcome possible has happened, she's dead, I think it's insulting to her memory now to still come out and then try and um, remove responsibility from who is actually responsible, right? Abike Dabri is responsible. Nitcom is responsible. And they failed. They did not do their job. And now they're coming, coming around, they're, they're coming out with statements and telling lies, even trying to infer that somehow this was Italy's fault, that, oh, you know, it was a very difficult case, and the fact that she is an alias made it more difficult than it would have been, which is not true, because they are aware right from the beginning that she had an alias and what the alias was, and that, oh, somehow the road trip from Abidjan to Bondoku, supposedly for us, is such a big deal. That, wow. Yeah, you know, that's I, like remember, I remember from, that I, I read, you know, that line, where they, you know, made emphasis on the four hours, you know, like it was such a huge sacrifice that they had to drive four hours. And I, I personally was shocked, you know, that this, this is the huge sacrifice, the massive sacrifice that Nidcom has made that they drove four hours. I, I saw yeah, it in I mean, a statement yeah, and I was shocked. She also even you know, made... I, I, I was stunned, actually, that they had to make that statement, that, they, that there's a four-hour road. And so what? Just during the, the, the interview she granted recently, she also made mention of the fact that, you know, where she actually lived was really, really far, and they made all of that effort. And at some point, uh, you also need to find out the fact that, uh, you, you know, maybe she was involved in child trafficking right. and what have D you. David... Uh, just like David has actually mentioned. But I, I'll allow you, you know, right. to go ahead. David, I, I, I want to, you know, ask... Is Itulu's case, you know, another example of Nigeria's, the Nigerian state's reaction to the value of the Nigerian life here in Nigeria or in any other part of the world, those in diaspora also? Or is this just a failure of Nidcom as a body? It's both. It's, it's, the, it's the continuation of the, the, the regular posturing of the Nigerian state. 
clearly, as I mentioned elsewhere yesterday, the Nigerian state does not um, think of itself primarily as an institution whose job is to protect and, and, and further the interests of, of Nigerian people. It doesn't see itself as that. The Nigerian state sees itself as an institution whose job is to pay itself salaries and, and, and to make money. And it just so happens that, you know, if the way to do that is to, you know, is to occupy an office, supposedly, you know, on paper it is to help Nigeria as well, so be it. But in practice, it's not going to do anything. And NIPOM is just an extension of that. Why, why was NIPOM created in the first place? There's a Ministry of Foreign Affairs already, right? And then you have this MDA, which is created to basically, which is supposedly under the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, but which is now competing with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So there's always, there's always this uncertainty about who is even doing what. So I remember, um, I think it was last year, when um, a, a lady from Kano State, I think her name was Zena Bali, was arrested in Saudi Arabia with, uh, with I believe just cocaine in, in her possession, with drugs in her possession. I know what the Saudi law states regarding people who, who, who traffic drugs in, into the country. And the Nigerian states moved heaven and earth to make sure that this, this lady was out within four months. Right. And I'm going to come back to that later. But the point I'm making here is that when she came back, then you then had Abigail Dabri and Geoffrey Onyama, who is the Minister of Foreign Affairs, involved in this very embarrassing public cat fight for who was supposed to get credit for freeing this girl from Saudi custody. So you had Bitcoin going against the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. So really, that, that alone just tells you that it's all about the cloud chasing. It's all about who gets publicly credited for something. It's not really about doing the work. It's not really about protecting the interests of Nigerians. It's just about, you know, putting out statements, looking good wherever possible, getting paid your salaries and extra codes and whatever. And then when a Nigerian citizen genuinely needs help in, his, in a position like that of it, you know, he then gets a big PA constantly telling the family that there is no money. There is no money. And how much is the money for? One million naira is one million naira a fantastic sum of money for any kind of Nigerian government institution to raise, even at local level, much less federal level. But somehow, you know, it's not their problem. You know, so you people should sort yourselves out. Well, we are the government, our job is to enjoy ourselves and to and to be in to be in office, to be in power. That's that's what we are here for. They're here for the trappings of power, the appearance of authority, the 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 form of office, but not the substance, not the responsibility not the work. All right, David Ndeyi, just uh, before we coast it down, at what point do you think the Nigerian government should have intervened in the case of Itinu Babalola? Um, right from the very start, when, when, when this ordeal of her started, the first uh, institution she reached out to was the Nigerian embassy in Cote d'Ivoire. And the Nigerian embassy, again, in keeping with the, the posturing of the Nigerian government, basically, uh, made no effort whatsoever to try to resolve the situation, to try and help their citizens. What they were more interested in was how to milk her money. So first of all, they gave her wrong information. They told her that um, they can't help her because um, she's, you know, she wasn't in Cote d'Ivoire with a, with, 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 with a passport, with a valid passport, with a Nigerian passport. So um, she's going to need to give them 400,000 Naira to procure a Nigerian passport for her. First of all, that information was wrong because as we know, Africa is, is an ECOWAS member state, as is Nigeria. As long as you can prove that you are a Nigerian citizen, nobody in the way in the ECOWAS, nowhere in the ECOWAS region can you be classified as an illegal migrant or an illegal resident. It's not true. They they, they, they gave her that false information specifically so that they could extract money from her more than ten times the face value of the Nigerian passport as of 2019. And then bear in mind that all it in actual because i've spoken to a lawyer about this all she actually needed was something called a consular card to prove her citizenship to prove her identity but that's supposed to be issued free of charge and instead the nigerian embassy in Ivory Coast was trying to extract four hundred thousand naira from her because that's that's what the nigerian government exists to exploit nigerian people to exploit some citizens so right from the start she reached out and the nigerian government at that point could have intervened but that made this whole problem go away right from the start they didn't. And she spent the best part of two years going back and forth with them, trying to negotiate, trying to fix it in-house. And also, they might, you know, she didn't want to, like, sell her family name. You know, she didn't want people back home to know that, you know, Itunum Babalola is in prison. So she was there, you know, trying to solve it quietly before eventually she realized that these people are not interested, people are not going to help. So 
let me see if I can reach out to, to the media in Nigeria to join it. Somebody who can help put my story out, which is what she did in March. And then after that story came out, then the Nigerian government again got, you know, got interested, got uh, started pretending to be active because there was a ground swell of publicity. And as soon as the publicity, you know, the temporary spot of publicity died, their interest waned too. And that was that. And then now that she has died, they are all, they are just waiting for the for the publicity around this to go away as well. So that everybody will move on. That's that's what that's what is happening. It's, it's a really, 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 really sad story. Um, and of course, we should also quickly mention that we had sent a message to Abike Dabiri uh, to, of course, uh, share her side of the story. Uh, but, you know, there was no actual response. And, uh, we'll, of course, we'll bring her in if we get a response from her. She replied with a press release instead. Um, David, what happens next? Um, and what steps, you know, are, are going to be taken, you know, moving, moving forward? Um, so, first of all, the most important thing is to get um, its own body back, uh, uh, sent back to Nigeria, return to Nigeria so that our family can, give, can look at her one last time and give her a, a befitting burial. Um, I actually, I'm actually in the process of putting together a fundraiser for her dad. So, if, uh, if anyone uses Twitter here, if you go to my Twitter handle, my, my pinned tweet, the first tweet you see is the fundraiser. The account is his personal account, his direct bank account. It's a, I think it's a Wema account or so. So essentially, the purpose of that is that the Nigerian embassy told him that they are not going to pay to have the body uh, sent to Nigeria. So either uh, she be buried anonymously in Cote d'Ivoire, you know, like the nobody she was like, like nobody they treated her like in real life, in, in her life, or, or he would have to pay to, to have her sent to have her body sent to Nigeria. And obviously, he doesn't have the money, so we're doing a fundraiser for that. Um, two days ago, um, she was he was in conversation with. And she basically told him that um, she would she would sort out the process of getting the body sent back to Nigeria. She would do it, but in return, he would have to stop speaking to the media. He would have to stop talking to the press, stop granting interviews. So essentially, she was trying to use his daughter's body as a bargaining chip, right, to make him do what she wanted. So I I got very angry when I heard that. I actually recorded and uploaded the conversation without his consent, even though you're not supposed to do that. But I was angry enough to do that, and I said, look. Let's all raise this money ourselves and get this 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 state's body back from Cote d'Ivoire ourselves. Let's completely remove the Nigerian government's um, relevance in this situation. If Abike Dabri doesn't want to help, you know, let her come and eat her help. We can do this ourselves. So um, that's that's the, the current situation now. We're trying to crowdfund. So if you go to my handle, that's at David Mendeni on Twitter. The first thing you see there. Is the fundraiser. So, if, any amount you have, if it's 500 naira, please send it's, uh, the account name is a man over blah, 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 that's a that. You see, you see details there. So, that's that's currently what, what we're doing. All right. D David uh, Hundain, thank you so much. Um, I always enjoy speaking with you. Sadly, we never speak on happy stories, it's always some <laughs> tragedy or the other. But thank you very much for your time this morning, and uh, we we'll look forward to talking, talking to you again. Thank you. All right, and of course, uh, that is the story of uh, Itunu Baba Lola. We also spoke with uh, Renu Oduala earlier, and of course, uh, Mr. Adishino Mulano, who's uh, lead counsel to the NSAS protesters. Uh, this is where we wrap up the program this morning. If you missed out, remember where to catch up on social media platforms. It's at Class TV Africa on Facebook and Instagram and YouTube as well. Do not forget to have a great day. I am Messi Bopo. And I am Osaogi Ogbawan. <laughs>